Hello, everyone. Uh, this is lesson 28, uh, where we are continuing our discussion of uh, Octavian Augustus um, and Virgil's Aeneid. Um, today, we will do so from a wider context, um, because we are going to consider his role in transforming Rome itself uh, in this period. Uh, to begin, I want to uh, think about two uh, late Republican cultural trends. So these would be trends um, in wider society uh, in the period of the late Republic, especially I would say from the 70s and 60s BCE on. And uh, those two trends are uh, the evolution of Roman uh, love poetry and uh, the influence of Greek philosophy. And you might uh, wonder why we are talking about these matters in uh, uh, a history course. Uh, but I think it's quite helpful for us to understand it as a context in which Augustan influence uh, takes shape, and it can really help us see what uh, Augustus has in mind, what changes he's proposing and, and pushing through, uh, in contrast to how uh, a wide sway of the population might have uh, uh, been um, uh, thinking or uh, appreciating life. So uh, to start, I want to mention uh, uh, a poet that some of you may have er already heard about, and his name is uh, uh, Catullus, and he is uh, a contemporary of Julius Caesar, so this kind of would give us a sense this is just before um, Augustus, and he is of equestrian rank, so he's definitely someone who has some means. Um, uh, similarly to uh, uh, Virgil, he's also from uh, Cisalpine Gaul, and uh, um, we know that he, in fact, had something of a political career insofar as uh, he was traveling in what is today's uh, Turkey uh, on the staff of a provincial governor in uh, 57 uh, BCE. And uh, what's interesting about uh, uh, Catullus is that we have 116 poems of his uh, surviving, uh, and they seem focused on what appear to us as clearly personal concerns. And uh, what I mean by that is traditionally Latin poetry and uh, Latin text that we have uh, engaged with were more focused on uh, more formal uh, public aspects of life, uh, such as uh, military campaigns, uh, uh, familial inheritance. Uh, and here uh, we see uh, the evolution of a way of talking about things that may not have been much discussed uh, in uh, uh, sort of developed cultural language uh, before. So um, some of these uh, poems address uh, a love affair with uh, a woman identified in the poetry as lesbia, who is probably uh, uh, Claudia. And also uh, in the poems, he talks about a male sexual partner, uh, uh, Juventius, uh, and that's uh, uh, six poems uh, uh, address that. The reason these are um, uh, um, uh, interesting for us to observe uh, because it gives us a sense, uh, something about uh, the level of passion ancient Romans might have engaged with. And the one point that should be uh, made very clear is that neither of these are uh, Catullus's legitimate relationships, such as a, a marriage, right? So this is also publicizing something that's quite uh, uh, um, illicit uh, from the perspective of traditional Roman public life. So to give you a little taste of that uh, uh, poetry, uh, the first one is just a two-liner, and uh, uh, there is no extra credit, but uh, there is a faculty member in our department who has uh, some of this in Latin tattooed on his arm, and if you find out, uh, uh, you should probably take Latin. Uh, but this is the two two-line poem, I hate and love, and why, perhaps you will ask, I don't know, but I feel and I'm tormented. Now, I don't know if you have ever been in love before, uh, but I would say this is something that, you know, today people describe about love. And so, um, uh, and this is definitely not something that in Roman poetry we would have encountered uh, before this time. And one other way of thinking about this is that if we uh, consider the history uh, starting uh, already in the 80s BCE, Rome's history in the first century is one of civil wars, uh, lots of blood in the streets, people uh, getting violently killed. And I think it's against that rather rough public uh, uh, landscape that these personal emotions gain new uh, importance and significance. 
So the second poem is uh, uh, one written to uh, this uh, uh, pseudonymed woman, Lesbia, who is probably Claudia. And this is what he uh, uh, says, let us live, my Lesbia, let us love, and all the words, words of the old and so moral, may they be worth less than nothing to us. Suns may set and suns may rise again, but when our brief light has set, night is one long everlasting sleep. Give me a thousand kisses, a hundred more, another thousand and another hundred. And when we have counted up the many thousands, confuse them so as not to know them all, so that no enemy may cast an evil eye by knowing that there were so many kisses. So this poem, um, one of the things, one of the many things that's uh, really beautiful and striking about it is that on the one hand, we have here a sense of life as quite short, right? A brief light, our life is a brief light, and then we'll just be dead. Uh, and, um, and the other uh, uh, piece uh, that's, uh, that's interesting is that Catullus uses this energy, this sense that we may just die, so we might as well kiss now. Uh, he uses this energy to argue against uh, the old and the moral people, and he instead say, let us, let us live and let us love, right? So we can just see how much uh, this is not the kind of poetry that, uh, um, you know, um, traditional Roman morality would have, uh, uh, would have endorsed. And in this context, I wanted to uh, uh, mention that uh, Augustus, in fact, had uh, uh, a daughter uh, who was called, because of the Julius family name that he took on, uh, uh, Julia. And we know quite a bit about her, and you will hear more about her in the context of her marriages, which were essentially always to men whom Augustus considered a potential uh, heir, or uh, clearly not love marriages. And so, um, so Julia uh, is actually was quite famous for having uh, affairs. And uh, uh, at a certain point, Augustus had uh, such a hard time uh, dealing with her, and she was certainly not a teenager anymore, but she was older, that uh, he decided to exile her, right? So uh, his own daughter. But I think it gives us a sense, not just a, uh, I mean, it's sort of the generations are turned around, right? Because it's a younger generation revolting. But it's that Augustus is the more moralizing change in this process, and Julia, the daughter, is the one who is more uh, still outgoing and is sort of uh, um, embracing a, a fuller uh, life, the kind of maybe that, that Catullus would have um, endorsed. And so the reason this is worth uh, uh, for us uh, to think about is that we have already uh, talked about that Augustus presented himself as a very moral uh, figure. Uh, he had uh, uh, virtues, and uh, I think that a good uh, 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 way of uh, uh, thinking about this is to think about uh, a particular aspect of uh, uh, Augustan rule, uh, which is that Augustus actually came a title which is Pater Patriae, Father of the Fatherland. And this was a title which essentially made him something like a patron to all of the Romans, right? So what does this mean? Uh, this means something like uh, paternal authority to make sure that his own family behaves, right? So this is the kind of authority that he might use to uh, discipline uh, Julia. Um, incidentally, in the ancient world, uh, there was no quite such thing as a grown-up woman. Most women belonged under someone, a male family member's um, authority. And so that would have given Augustus more power to um, uh, shape her life. Now, uh, more extended, paternal authority also allowed Augustus to make sure that his clients uh, behaved. And this uh, client would be, remember, in the patron-client relationship, someone who is in a formal arrangement with uh, Augustus of support, mutual support, if you, if you wish, even if there is obviously a huge power differential between the two sides. But I think that it's helpful to think about Augustus as uh, having this paternal authority to make sure that all of his Romans behave. So he has this uh, pater patriae, I am uh, the patron to all of the Romans, and therefore uh, they should all uh, uh, behave. 
And we can see this uh, play out actually in Augustan uh, legislation uh, on multiple levels of society. And to think about this, it's worth uh, thinking for a moment about Roman social structure. And um, if we look at this uh, slide here, we see on the very top uh, imperial domus, where domus means home or house. So this is the imperial house. This would be the top of Roman society. This would be Augustus, as well as uh, uh, people closely associated with him, his family members, but also his uh, uh, slaves, potentially. Then uh, the traditional top of Roman so society, of course, would be senators. Below them are the equestrians or knights. There would be a lot of uh, free common people. And then there would be some people who are slaves or used to be slaves and now are freed. Now, um, while I like the visual that this image uh, uh, provides about uh, social structure, I think it's uh, helpful to uh, maybe think about some important uh, uh, modifications uh, to that, um, that um, uh, slide insofar as um, Senators, equestrians, of course, uh, are two uh, top levels of society, traditionally speaking. But there is a question about was there something like a middle class in ancient Rome? And most people today would say no, but there were, in fact, uh, uh, a large group of free people who were generally quite poor and uh, depended on uh, benefactions from others um, or who were essentially not quite necessarily subsistence uh, uh, living, but like very low uh, level of uh, uh, financial uh, security. Um, freedmen and slaves um, are a good useful distinction, but one question, there is another group also who we can sort of wonder about, and those would be women. And of course, uh, uh, even if you are a woman, who is from a senatorial family, it would be fair to say that you still fall under very special rules. You're still not your own person. You still cannot have property. Uh, so um, we see that maybe that's one other thing that's sort of missing from this picture uh, uh, that we have just seen. Now I'm gonna show you one more slide that's looking even a little bit more complicated and that's why I'm, I, I usually hold it as uh, the third one is, and this is I think is uh, in many ways the best uh, representation of uh, uh, Roman uh, society and its complex uh, uh, structure. Uh, it shows us the emperor and his household on top uh, the senators and then the uh, equestrians. What it also does a good job of is showing us that there are sort of upper classes uh, that include sort of local aristocracies all around the empire. So say you go travel to modern day uh, Turkey or Spain, you would encounter their members of the elite who are quite wealthy. They are not senators or equestrians, but who are very important in um, uh, maintaining local order. And it is in fact uh, through this local aristocracy that quite a bit of uh, Augustine um, uh, politics is played out. And we will talk more about uh, uh, sort of that politics throughout in the period of the Roman Empire. Another interesting aspect of this to think about this, this chart is that uh, the emperor's uh, slaves and freedmen often end up in very high social positions. So uh, for the emperor, it would be quite comfortable or, and convenient to use someone like uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, former slaves now as a freedman, so they're not, you know, they're not slaves, but they're freed, as someone to take care of his business, right? So essentially, uh, almost like um, government administrators. So in fact, uh, there will be quite a few of these freedmen who play very important roles throughout the period of the Roman uh, uh, Empire. Now, the only problem with this is that imagine if a senator or an equestrian has to negotiate with a former uh, uh, slave and that former slave has more power than they do, that would make them probably quite uh, uncomfortable. Now, um, to give us a sense of how Augustus is trying to interfere in sort of the kind of uh, uh, freedom that we discussed in the context of Catullus in this period, we in fact have evidence that Augustus very much intervened into uh, uh, the regulation of social and moral customs. So in a, in a bunch of laws, um, the Julian Law of 18 BC and the uh, 9 C. P. Papian Popeyan law, uh, I'm more concerned that you just know that there was legislation than uh, the actual names by which they went. He introduced some unprecedented legislation 
uh, that um, uh, sort of really try to nail down some social and moral customs. So for example, the laws uh, uh, made adultery a criminal offense. Can you imagine that because you commit adultery now, you could get into uh, uh, legal troubles, right? Um, and I don't mean your um, uh, uh, partner, uh, marriage partner divorcing you, but instead really coming in front of the law. Senatorial men and women were not to marry free people, which sort of is suggestive of some uh, trying to fix people's social levels. And then last but not least, uh, childlessness was penalized in terms of offices and inheritances. So essentially he is having a very heavy handed uh, uh, participation and uh, um, uh, in fact influence on how families are and promoting family life and promoting having children and uh, uh, promoting uh, that, um, uh, that uh, kind of life. And if you look at this slide, you can see that uh, this kind of imagery, what you see here is a wife and a husband and they are holding hand, hands here, the joining of the right hands being uh, sort of visual representation of marriage. This was one of the ways in which uh, uh, Augustus represented himself with his wife, Livia. And then also uh, this was a big part of sort of this familial uh, uh, propaganda at this time. Um, secondly, again, in terms of uh, uh, regulations, he also tried to regulate uh, manumission and citizenship. And manumission is not a word we have talked about so far. What it means is freeing of slaves, right? And I think that uh, uh, one of the things is that he tries to do is to limit the civil rights that um, freedmen have, right? So the idea is that you may be freed, but you are not a fully free person, right? So keeping you on that level, maybe your son or, or daughter could be uh, fully having full rights. Uh, but the second bit is a limiting numbers of freed by many mission, both in someone's will and in someone's lifetime, is clearly going against uh, trying to. Um, uh, limit the power someone might gain by having their own slaves act as managers of their power, right? So what I mean by that is that when we were looking at Augustus using his own freedmen uh, to help him run the empire, the same way some senator who is very wealthy and has uh, tens of thousands of slaves could have used them to be an army, to be uh, administrators, whatever you'd like, thereby potentially creating uh, political trouble, and that's what Augustus was trying to avoid. But both the uh, regulations on manumission and citizenship and on the social and uh, uh, moral customs are very suggestive to a heavy-handed influence uh, by Augustus in depicting himself as this paternalistic uh, uh, power figure. And that was uh, one part uh, of uh, the message that he uh, was delivering.